that people with high levels of melanin is sickle cell disease. According to the CDC, sickle cell disease affects approximately 100,000 Americans. When we dig a little deeper, we find that sickle cell disease occurs in one out of every 365 African-American births. Luckily, new treatments are constantly being researched and discovered. I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Milford Green and Dr. Lakshmanan Krishnamurti for their discussion focused on the impact of sickle cell disease on the Black community and new therapies to dissipate the painful symptoms of the disease. Dr. Green is a biomedical and public health scientist. He serves as the Director of Health Affairs and Clinical Services and is the Director of Sickle Cell Foundation of Georgia and a certified hemoglobinopathy laboratory. He's a retired former Associate Dean at Cornell University and was the first diversity dean at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. Dr. Lakshman, Lakshmanan Krishnamurti is the newly appointed Chief of Pediatric Hematology and Oncology for Yale's Department of Pediatrics and Yale New Haven Children's Hospital. Just newly appointed this past October 1st. Dr. Krishnamurti is an accomplished pediatric hematologist, oncologist, and an international leader in bone marrow transplant and the treatment of hemoglobinopathies, hemoglobinopathies, with successful funding for his clinical research on sickle cell disease for more than 22 years. Dr. Krish mainly focuses on clinical and patient-centered outcomes, including systems approach to the delivery of care. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. Those who are participating and uh, observing this session, ask your questions in the Q&A, and we look forward to learning more about these new therapies and how we can help to reduce the painful symptoms of sickle cell disease. Thank you, gentlemen, and welcome. Good morning, and thank you very much. Uh, we're very, very pleased to be here with you this morning and uh, to have this opportunity to, to address this uh, uh, great group uh, assembled by, by Black Health Matters. And I'm just going to make a couple of opening statements here. Uh, 70 years ago, the sickle cell, sickle cell disease was at the cutting edge of uh, biomedical research as the first medical condition to be linked to medical cause. So it was, quote unquote, the, um, the first molecular disease. But the ensuing decades have seen, at, at times, uh, limited uh, uh, progress in cl clinical care, leaving patients afflicted with the disease uh, to uh, be in severe pain and to have shortened life expectancies. Um, there was a long period during which there was no treatment really essentially at all. But in 1998, the first drug, sickle cell drug was approved and that was hydroxyurea. But recent progress in gene therapy uh, is now giving researchers um, the tools they need to tackle this disease at its molecular level. And several clinical trials have demonstrated the therapeutic promise of manipulating the genome uh, using viruses to deliver genes or the CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing technology to counteract the damage of this, this disease, um, a sickle cell disease. And crucially, these technologies can be incorporated into existing protocols for uh, a potent treatment called hemopoietic stem cell transpl transplantation, uh, the curative impact of which is limited only by the shortage of eligible donors. So the National Academy of Sciences, Medicine, Technology, uh, and at the National Heart, Lung, and Blood at the National Institutes of Health approximately three years ago pledged that they would have sickle cell cured in five to 10 years. And we're about two to seven years into it now, we should have some rather dramatic results. But of course, there are always risks. And um, we've asked one of the real uh, giants in this area, Dr. 
Krishnamurti uh, to sort it all out for us in the next 20 minutes or so. And perhaps we'll have eight to 10 minutes of uh, lively discussion. So please uh, put your questions in the Q&A section and we will hopefully get to them or if not need, need be follow up on those questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Krish. Thank you. Um, thank you very much uh, for uh, taking uh, time from your busy lives on the Saturday morning. Uh, of the many advances that we are fortunate to be witness to, uh, gene therapy uh, is one um, uh, that fundamentally could change um, our approach to managing sickle cell disease. So over the next 20 minutes or so, I hope to give you a little bit of a primer on this. Um, so let's start from the basics, sickle cell disease. Why are we considering treatment for sickle cell disease? Because it's a serious disease uh, that affects the whole body. What happens in sickle cell disease? Normally the red blood cells are shaped thus. It's, a, it's like a jelly filled biconcave disc, which is very flexible. Uh, but there is a genetic mutation that causes an abnormal type of protein, abnormal hemoglobin to be formed. And so the red cell becomes like this, uh, a sickle shaped and it's rigid and sticky and basically clogs the blood circulation. And so downstream, there's a problem with delivery of oxygen and tissues die when they don't have oxygen. And this is how the sickle red cells look under the microscope. This is how your normal red cells look. If you stain the blood smear and, and look at it under the microscope, this is a biconcave disc. And this is a sickle uh, stick shape. Now, what does this do? This affects every part of the body from the top to the bottom. Uh, people can get a stroke. Uh, they may have difficulties in cognition. They may have problems with the eyes. Uh, they have a problem called acute chest syndrome, which is type of infection or uh, organ tissue destruction. Uh, they may have cardiac problems with heart failure, pulmonary hypertension, may need surgery for gallbladder, uh, may have kidney problems. They may have delays in puberty. The, the bones, uh, because of the lack of blood supply in, from one direction, um, then they can be avascular necrosis of the hip bone, for instance. Um, and in addition to that, their spleen stops functioning. So the children may die of an overwhelming pneumonia even before they get diagnosed with sickle cell. So that is why every baby born in the United States is screened for sickle cell at birth. Uh, and immediately they have to be put on antibiotics and uh, maintained on an oral penicillin and uh, vaccination against pneumococcal bacteria. Big problem with sickle cell disease is uh, recurrent acute pain, as well as chronic persistent pain. And Dr. Green mentioned how this can be a devastating consequence uh, for the patient. So these acute and chronic complications can make the quality of life quite poor but also unfortunately decrease the quantity of life by 20 to 30 years. So it's a serious disease and which is why so many are coming together to do something about it. So I wanna start off with another foundational question uh, of what is a stem cell, because this is something that's there in common parlance, but often uh, people mean different things by uh, that when they call, uh, when they use the word stem cell. So we all started as one cell, that is uh, the egg and the sperm got together and made one whole human cell. And that cell multiplies and differentiates and then ultimately makes a whole person. So that is the original stem cell, sort of a stem and the branches come off of it. So that's what's a stem cell. But the, when the stem cells, when they sort of divide, uh, you know, one becomes two, becomes four, becomes eight, becomes 16, becomes 32. Some of the st stem cells start specializing. And so one of the type of stem cells that we're interested in is the blood making stem cell or hematopoietic stem cell. So when I am talking about a stem cell, I'm talking about a hematopoietic stem cell. When they're talking in Congress about 
what stem cell research should not happen. They're talking about the undifferentiated pluripotent stem cell that can make a whole person. So, um, so let's talk more about the blood making stem cells. So this is the initial stem cell and that multiplies. And then this is the hematopoietic or blood making stem cells. And these make different types of cells, the red blood cells, platelets and white blood cells. So the red blood cells are the cells that have a protein called hemoglobin and hemoglobin picks up oxygen from the lungs and in the circulation, it travels to the rest of the body and that's where it gives up oxygen. And oxygen, as you know, is the gas that makes the body's fires burning. So we all started as a single stem cell, some may specialize, and, and then they make all these other types of cells. So this is the problem in a sickle cell. There's a genetically abnormal stem cell and that produces abnormal red blood cells. So in trying to cure sickle cell disease, we are trying to replace this abnormal stem cell. And that's what a stem cell transplantation is about. So uh, what has been available now for the last, since the 1970s is called bone marrow transplant. And when you get it from somebody else, aloe means somebody else, allogeneic bone marrow transplant, you collect the bone marrow from a donor. Sometimes it has to be processed. You give the recipient chemotherapy to kill off their original abnormal bone marrow. For instance, a bone marrow that's making blood that has abnormal red cells like sickle cell disease or a bone marrow that's making abnormal white cells that's like leukemia. Um, and so you have to kill that and then you infuse this new bone marrow and that goes in there and sets up shop and um, you uh, then have normal bone marrow and normal blood. Problem with uh, bone marrow is who can serve as a bone marrow donor. So there is in the, our DNA, uh, as you know, uh, if anybody watched a crime teller, you know how you identify somebody uh, by uh, traces of their DNA. And that's because we have these unique proteins uh, on the white blood cell called HLA, and we carry the DNA in two copies. So dad has two copies and mom has two copies. So every time you make a baby, these are scrambled in multiple different uh, potential combinations. So which means that if this is a person who inherited this particular 13, 14, 15 from dad, and 1, 11, 12 from mom has a one in four chance of a sibling being a match. There is a one in four chance that a sibling is not a match at all. And there's a one in four chance that a sibling is half matched. So most of the transplants happened when you were fully matched the chance of that happening was 25% or less because a small and melted families is probably 15%. So straight away, you can see that not everybody can have a bone marrow transplant from a sibling donor. So, and these are the way the combinations can happen. And as you can understand. So in general, better the match, better the outcome. So the best outcome is if you were lucky enough in the genetic lottery to have a sibling who inherited the same half on this HLA from both your parents. The other thing is if you're going to do a transplant, it's best to do it from a sibling who is identical for HLA and if the sibling and you are young. So if you look at this, uh, blue is a child under the age of five years, green is six to 15 years, and red is 15 years and older. So if you have a transplant from a sibling donor under the age of five years, your chances of survival are close to 100%. And your chances that the transplant will work is close to 96, 97%. If you waited 10 years, you have a 10 year, 10% 10 drop in possibilities of survival and 10% drop in the chances that it you will have a successful outcome. However, bone marrow transplant is not a trivial treatment. It's about as intensive a treatment as you can get uh, in, in your life. Uh, typically, patients after bone marrow transplant have to be in the hospital for four to six weeks. 
They get severe mouth sores. So mouth sores are graded one through four and pretty much everybody can expect to have severe mouth sores of grade four. That means that they can't eat or drink and they're going to need IV pain medicine. And this lasts for a couple of weeks. And because the lining of your, uh, you know, your mouth and intestines is your first line of defense, you have bacteria getting into your blood. Um, you can have organ damage. You can have multiple life-threatening complications. And you'd have to be seen in the clinic for a long time, uh, as often as one to three times a week for six to eight months. So as you can imagine, this is a substantial burden on the family in addition to being the patient themselves. In addition to that, there are long-term potential complications because you're taking somebody else's cells and putting them inside you. Nature was designed to keep other people's cells out, just like other bugs out. And so you have an immune warfare going on between the donor cells and your cells, and that's called graft versus host disease. That can happen early. It can happen late and it can affect multiple parts of the body. The chemotherapy that we give to wipe out the bone marrow can un unfortunately have collateral damage and it can seriously affect the gonads and cause infertility. Sometimes, unfortunately, the damage caused by chemotherapy can predispose you to get cancer or get a heart, kidney or lung damage or thyroid problems or diabetes. So clearly it's not without potential problems. And to give you a picture of how somebody with chronic graft versus host disease might look like, this gentleman has this dryness of his skin, a rash, and the skin has all become thickened and he's actually got contractures that his knees are constantly bent, his um, uh, elbows like that, he can't really straighten out his fingers and it can cause all these other organ problems as you can see. Uh, this is a kind of discoloration and scarring uh, that you can see. So uh, you could be cured of your disease, but unfortunately have long-term complications. So the decision to consider transplantation is one of the most difficult risk benefit paradigms. On the one hand, especially if you have an HLA identical sibling and you're young, that the chances of cure are excellent. Um, so you could actually live a life free of sickle cell disease without all the complications we talked about and possibly live a normal length of life. On the other hand, there is a small risk. You know, If you're under the age of five, the risk is 1%. If you're over the age of 15, that risk may be eight or 10%. So there's a small risk of dying. And then there's a risk of treatment related complications such as graft versus host disease. And then long-term effects uh, such as infertility, cancer, uh, and endocrine problems or heart lung problems. The other factors that modulate this decision is age, younger, better, donor options. Do you have a sibling donor? And what about the other treatment options? So in the last uh, for 25 years, we had only one drug for sickle cell disease, hydroxyurea. In the last three years, we have three new drugs. There are at least a dozen new drugs in clinical trials. So again, this risk benefit ratio can be modulated by new drugs that are coming out. In general, uh, what the, the, the thumb on the pan that makes somebody want to consider transplant is that they have a lot of painful episodes that their life currently is that quality of life is no longer acceptable, or they've had a stroke and need to be on blood transfusion, or uh, we talked about the lung complications or acute chest syndrome. And if you're having recurrent problems like that, these are usually the reasons why somebody would consider a transplant. So let's talk now about gene therapy. So remember a, a gene is part of the DNA. The DNA is a set of instructions that are there in every cell of our being. And the DNA is like a template or a stencil. And it tells, it makes a protein and all these proteins have numerous different functions. Um, and so the gene is the master controller. So gene therapy means either you have a diseased gene, it's a genetic disorder and you add a healthy gene. 
And that goes and sits in your DNA. And then lo and behold, you're making healthy protein, even though you're continuing to make unhealthy protein. You could go back and edit the gene and you can either do that to cut a gene that controls another gene. This is one of the most complex servo systems where there's checks and balances. So you could unsilence, you could uh, inactivate a, a silent gene or uh, uh, you can activate a silent gene. So, so these are things that you can do. And then the ultimate is, to replace a mutated gene with a healthy copy of the gene. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so this is the holy grail uh, if you can actually fix the genetic problem. Uh, so I want to give you an outline uh, of how a gene therapy is done. So the first thing is to collect the blood-making stem cells. Now the blood-making stem cells live in the bone marrow, which lives in the long and flat bones. So we give a medicine that allows the bone marrow to float out of the, the bone marrow space, some of these cells, blood-making stem cells, and come into the circulation. So once they're in their circulation, we can connect the circulation to a machine called an apheresis machine. The blood flows into the machine and comes back into the patient and the machine harvests the blood-making stem cells. This is sent to a laboratory and we find the cells that are actually the granddaddy cells uh, the blood-making stem cells, and we can use a virus called a Len T virus. It's actually a virus that's very similar to HIV, but it's not the full virus. We're just, it's a laboratory-made virus, which has some elements of the virus. And we put this, pro this gene that we want into it. And so just like a virus, it goes into the cell and then it becomes part of the DNA and the virus is gone. So you can no longer find this virus in the circulation. It does not have the ability to replicate or, or hang around. So, and now you have your stem cells that have a copy of the healthy gene. Meanwhile, you give the patient high dose chemotherapy, like I talked about it in bone marrow transplant and wipe out his or her bone marrow and you infuse the new cells and they go in and set up shop and make new blood. The thing that you're not doing, which is different from bone marrow transplant, is you're not suppressing their immune system for a long time because these are their own cells. So there is no immunological warfare going on when you take cells and modify them and put them back in. So I'm going to give you, share with you uh, uh, results of one of the studies that is uh, close to accrual now, and uh, this is called HGB206. And uh, if you look at this uh, picture, um, so the red sauce, uh, so vasoocclusive episodes, uh, meaning um, clinical problems caused by the blood clogging the blood vessel in sickle cell disease. And that usually presents as severe pain, it could present as stroke, it could present uh, as a pneumonia, acute chest syndrome. And severe is if you've been, got to be in the hospital and those are the red ones. And so these are vasoclusive crisis and severe vasoclusive crisis in these uh, uh, patients. And this is the duration of follow-up uh, on these patients. So in the two years, as you can see, uh, day in the life of a patient with sickle cell disease is peppered with episodes of vasoclusive uh, uh, crisis and they have to be in the hospital. And as you can see after transplant, virtually none, virtually none. You don't see any red dots, especially if beyond the first six months. So, so far, at least in terms of the vasoclusive episodes, the early results on these patients is very exciting and encouraging. Now, this is what their blood looks like. Now, think about this as green is bad blood and pink or fuchsia or whatever that color is good blood. So because they have their old gene making sickle blood, they continue to make sickle blood. But then the new gene is making new pink blood here, new good blood here that doesn't have the problems with making the cells sickle. And so they're roughly becoming about half and half, a little more than half. And typically, um, you know, if you have somebody with sickle cell trait, 
they're about 60% healthy and 40% unhealthy. Here we have about 52% healthy and 46% unhealthy. So people with sickle cell trait are, um, you know, uh, in, in the normal course are of living completely normal lives. And so gene therapy approximates sickle cell trait. Um, so a child could be pretty much like both his parents who would have sickle cell trait. Also, uh, as Dr. Green mentioned, pain is the biggest problem. And there are people who have a lot of pain. These orange uh, patients, they are worse than the population a norm for pain, and they seem to have a dramatic impact. People who didn't have a lot of pain still have impact, not quite as dramatic, but clearly after uh, gene therapy, there is a dramatic decrease in pain uh, below that of the population norm for pain. I wanna talk a little bit about the complications, and I wanna say that overall, uh, the complications are similar to what you might see in somebody who gets chemotherapy and gets their own cells back. And you can do that for myeloma or lymphoma. So uh, about uh, two weeks um, you know, of, uh, before the bone marrow starts working and you'll probably spend about a month in the hospital. You're not getting immunosuppression for months uh, and you don't get graft versus host disease. So uh, there were no liver damage and there was nobody in which the virus uh, stayed on. One person died suddenly, we don't know why. Um, and we think that it's due to prior sickle cell problems, but this is the most concerning that two patients have developed leukemia. And earlier this year for almost six, seven months, the NIH had put a hold on the study. We don't know if the, the um, uh, the um, leukemia happened because of the chemotherapy, because of sickle cell disease, or because of the genetic modification. So after a long and intense conversation with experts all around the world, it was finally determined that these clinical trials should, should resume. Um, and uh, we are doing added testing to try and see, because some people believe that in sickle cell disease, you're, you're making a lot of new blood because your old blood is getting turned over fast, uh, that there may be increased risk for leukemia. So we don't know if it's due to that. So we are monitoring patients who've had gene therapy. We are screening patients more intensely prior to gene therapy to see if we can predict if there's any risk. Um, so one of the new uh, other techniques, uh, we talked about gene addition. Let's talk about CRISPR. Uh, it's got nothing to do with French fries. Uh, CRISPR is actually a way that viruses fight bacteria. So what happens is that a bacteria has a, a set of DNA. And once a virus uh, is attacked by that, bac uh, you know, sees that bacteria, it internalizes a little bit um, uh, of that DNA. Uh, sorry, uh, it's the bacteria fighting the virus. There are bacteriophage viruses. So the bacteria keeps a little bit of the virus DNA in its memory. The next time the virus comes along, it, the bacteria uses this DNA to match against that virus and then connects it to an enzyme that kills the virus. So nature did gene therapy long before we ever thought about it. So we took CRISPR from bacteria and applied it to making changes in the DNA in blood making stem cells. Uh, and so this is called gene editing. Uh, and one of the technologies used is called CRISPR and you'll hear about it quite a bit. Um, so this is an example of a patient who had a uh, pretty much a similar process. A blood making stem cell was collected uh, from the peripheral circulation. It was sent to a laboratory using a CRISPR uh, technology. Gene editing was done. And the way it was done was to wake up a gene that had been silenced. So you see, uh, when we are in the womb, the baby is not air breathing, so it can't really grab air oxygen from the air. 
So the baby is then competing with the mother for oxygen. So baby has a different hemoglobin called fetal hemoglobin and across the placenta, the fetal hemoglobin grabs the oxygen from the maternal hemoglobin. After the baby is born, as soon as it takes its first cry, it becomes an air breather so that fetal hemoglobin is no longer necessary and nature has a system to shut off genes that are not necessary. So the gene for fetal hemoglobin, a completely functional hemoglobin is silent and we edit it to cut out that gene. So now you start making fetal hemoglobin again. So this is a patient, as you can see, is making about 52% sickle hemoglobin. And this blue is about 43% fetal hemoglobin. Again, about half and half in this particular patient. And this has been enough to prevent sickling and relieve complications of sickle cell disease. So once again, to look at the difference between gene therapy and bone marrow transplant, in gene therapy, you use your own stem cells. In bone marrow transplant, you use a donor stem cells. You get chemotherapy to wipe out the bone marrow, same in both cases. There is no risk of graft versus host disease. If you saw that picture uh, with that person who was spent like that, but there's a risk of graft versus disease after bone marrow transplant. Gene therapy, your own cells. So you don't need six months, one year of immune suppression. Bone marrow transplant, you need that. Your stem cells are being modified. So which means that this is a biological system. You just put your mix in there and then the rest really nature has to do. But here in bone marrow transplant, you're just gathering the stem cells. These are functioning fine in the donor and you're just giving it to the patient. So in some ways, gene therapy effects are not quite as predictable. A biological modification is required. Here it's more predictable. If it works, it works really well. Are there long-term risks due to virus and due to gene modification? There is no virus and there's no gene modification. Are there long-term risks due to chemotherapy? Yes. And there are long-term risks due to chemotherapy. So here are the similarities between gene therapy and bone marrow transplant. So I want to stop here and remind you the reason we're considering these treatments is because sickle cell is a serious disease with morbidity, impaired quality of life, and mortality. If you did a transplant from a HLA mad sibling, especially at a young age, the outcomes are really good. We are doing clinical trials for doing fully matched or partially matched or half matched, uh, either unrelated donors or related donors to expand the possibilities of applying bone marrow transplant. Gene therapy, either gene addition or gene editing has the potential to ameliorate sickle cell disease. But above all, all of these, this is fairly complex. Uh, there's issues of uh, you know, informed consent that we must pay real attention to. And we can have all the best treatment in the world, but unless we make sure that access is ensured to all, uh, this is of no use. Again, access is not only to people in the United States uh, and the Western world, but also to people living in Africa and India who have sickle cell disease and where the resources are limited. I'll stop here and turn you over to uh, Dr. Green. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Krish. That was excellent uh, as usual. Uh, it's always a pleasure working with you. Uh, we have a uh, we had a few questions, but I'm pretty sure you have covered all of them in your presentation. So uh, I think we are out of time, and I guess we'll have to sign off at this point. So we thank Black Health Matters for this opportunity to uh, bring this message on sickle cell disease, and we look forward to uh, speaking to the audience again. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it.